Hello and welcome to Blog on the Range and I'm very happy to be able to welcome back to the channel Dale, our Stumco F57 obsessive, if I may be so bold, that's, that's appropriate. for the first of three Death by PowerPoint um, episodes on the use of the rifle grenade, the uh, scary flying carrots of doom. Um, and we're going to have to split it up into three because there's so much material to get through, including a demonstration in part two in my as yet unfurnished spare room, which is lucky. Procrastination sometimes pays off, so we've got space to do that. So um, basically, as usual, I'm more or less a passenger here, and I'm just going to ask Dale the odd question, poke him in certain directions, and basically you're in his hands. So if I hand the rifle off to you, which of course has been cleared first. <sighs> Thanks for having me again, Mike, and um, nice to see the audience again. Today we're going to continue the M58 rifle grenade saga. Uh, in case you just stumbled across this video and I'm not sure really what you, where you are, I recommend that you watch the previous two episodes on the history and the absolutely huge technical aspect. You don't have to watch all of it, but at least some. Uh, because I'm not going to explain the concepts again, um, I, you should know at least the difference between boosted and non-rocket boosted, uh, but other than that, I think you're pretty much in for a ride. To uh, basically, to summarize, some have a rocket booster in them, some don't. I exactly. As long as you appreciate this, because there'll be lots of talk of, uh, of rocket boosters and things like, things like that. Um, first of all, um, can I just be uncouth in the middle and say two things? First of all, Dale has his own little channel in which he puts up um, archive videos and things which he's subtitled. So uh, please check that out. I'll put the, 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 the link in the description below and the name of the channel on the screen and uh, it's due to the generosity of patrons who uh, make the channel possible and keep it chugging along so please consider um, just pausing a little bit, liking, subscribing, leaving a little comment, particularly saying how awesome Dale is and how awesome the depth of his knowledge is and uh, usual stuff to uh, feed the algorithm with engagement. So sorry for the interruption there. Fully understandable. All right so Basically speaking, uh, we're going to uh, split the entire thing in two chapters, in three videos. First chapter is going to treat on the launching equipment itself and the firing techniques, and the second chapter is going to treat more on the training operational doctrine side. So essentially speaking, we have completed the 360 degree view on the rifle grenade, essentially the history, the technical aspect, the practical aspect, and the more doctrinal aspect. 360 degrees. Now. In terms of launching equipment and basic handling, we're first going to go through the list of the launching equipment. So I'm going to go through a description on each and every single one of them. There's not a whole lot to go through because the Sturmgewehr was designed to be a fully integrated solution. And then we're going to talk about basic handling. So essentially transitioning from rifle cartridge to rifle grenade, reloading, and then vice versa. That will be today's video. Precisely. After that, direct fire. So pre-1983 and post-1983 techniques and indirect fire and we're going to talk about how these two firing techniques evolved, what were the trials that were done with extra devices, different techniques, etc, etc. Now in terms of launching equipment, um, the entire system is really remarkably simple. You have, of course, what we consider today as the launcher, not just the assault rifle, basically the Sturmgewehr 57 the interesting and unique rifle grenade launching magazine. After that, the pocket knife with the scaled bipod. The safety equipment and PPE, which is not as sexy, but still quite interesting. And of course, the M61 and M70 combat dresses. Uh, first, let's take a look at the, you know, this boat anchor right here and kind of analyze exactly what makes this a suitable rifle grenade launching platform. Uh, again, for those of you who stumbled across this video, I recommend that you watch the episode, the first episode I did with Mike on the channel uh, called Sturmgewehr How and Why. Essentially, we talk about the kind of design and historical context behind the adoption. and You'll see it does kind of make a certain amount of sense. It's, it's entirely coherent with its own logic. It's not a great rifle. It's not a great light machine gun. It's <laughs> Not a great platform for launching rifle grenades, but it does them all. It has its own in, in, internal logic, and as a, as a complete package, it does it very well, but it's a compromise in each of the particular roles. And it also replaced the various submachine guns as well, and it doesn't do that 
per se very well either. Not too much. But in and of itself, it, it passes the Ron Seal test. It does exactly what they expected of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, that's very true. Um, in order to approach this in a rational and technical manner, let's take a look at the technical specifications. I think we're going to project the slide onto your screen right now. But basically speaking, there are three points in the uh, technical specification, which I remind is contractual. So essentially when SIG delivers rifles, they have acknowledged that they will indeed deliver rifles to this specification. Now the very first one being, of course, the winter trigger lever. Can I just interrupt again because uh, uh, we spotted that a slight slip of the tongue in an earlier video by, by Dale um, <laughs> has made it into Fuddlaw. Unfortunately, I need to apologize. I, I, if I quote myself correctly, I remember stating in the video, this is not really a winter trigger, by the way. Because it isn't. <laughs> sort of. It, it, but yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'll let you. Well, let's be very clear. Uh, just before I start there, let's be very clear. This is indeed called a winter trigger in all official documentation. Even the technical drawings at SIG call this a winter abzug. However, and this is my personal opinion, I think that this device as a winter trigger for firing with gloves is absolutely bogus. Absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible because it is really unsafe. It's both an unprotected, lighter, and a protruding trigger. In my opinion, if they wanted to do this properly, they should have done it the Sturmgewehr 90 way. Essentially with the trigger guard pivoting out, accomplishes the same function in, in a much safer manner. Can I just interrupt you from a shooter's, from a shooter's perspective? Okay, so it's alongside the magazine there. It's, it, with gloves, you don't, you don't need much pressure to get it down, mm -hmm. but once it's down, it's just super exposed. It's crazy, yeah. It's, I mean, when these are used for sports shoot shooting, most people use the winter trigger because it gives a bit more leverage, and in fact, the trigger weight, because there's a, a minimum for the competitions, it's measured here, up against the, uh, the trigger guard, because practically nobody uses this. But you're absolutely right, it, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's clear that although it's called the winter trigger, its primary functionality is with the rifle grenades. And uh, it, that unfortunately slightly unclear statement has... Uh, I apologize for any vagueness. This is indeed a winter trigger. It's just my personal opinion and probably yours, we share the opinion, that from a modern perspective, it's a questionable design choice. Absolutely. Okay. Back to the point. Point 11A of technical specification. The weapon must be equipped with a winter trigger lever for firing with thick winter gloves or rifle grenades, as we mentioned before. Point 19, usage. Firing of rifle grenades through launching cartridges must be done with no damage to the weapon. It's a very vague uh, specification, but it's interesting to see how they applied this to the rifle. Point 18, rifle grenade provisions. Transition from ball ammunition to rifle grenade must be done quickly, simply, and without change to the weapon, except the magazine, even in the dark. The muzzle brake must be designed in such a way that doesn't need to be removed for rifle grenade shooting. During firing of rifle grenades, the weapon must function in such a way that the bolt remains closed and that a charging motion is required after each shot, independently from how the weapon is held. Okay. So imagine that you're an SIG engineer, or really an engineer team, and you see these technical specifications. How do you translate that into a drawing on the paper, into procedures for actually manufacturing said equipment? So let's take a look exactly on the very first aspect, which I find absolutely crazy. And this one responds directly to the point saying the weapon must not absorb any damage from rifle grenades. Uh, what you must understand is that the amount of recoil generated by these is roughly 200 newton meters. It's a boatload of recoil. Uh, not just in terms of energy, but also especially in terms of momentum. Well, that is momentum. Exactly, that is momentum, excuse me. And so, this places a lot of strain on your rifle design. Uh, if you take, for example, a Carabiner 31, uh, the stocking up, etc., was probably not designed for these kind of stresses. So when you design a weapon from the ground up to accept these kind of rifle grenades, you need to take into account these features. If we take a look at the Sturmgewehr 57, you can notice that first of all, it's a completely inline design. That means that the axis of the barrel also lines up with the axis of the stock. So it's essentially one straight line, even the moving parts as well. 
This means that when the weapon is supported against the ground for rifle grenade firing, essentially the force is directed straight into the weapon. There's no off-axis forces, no bending and twisting that might result in issues on the long run. However, it was not enough. Uh, during trials, it was noted that uh, the very early AM-55 prototypes had wooden and steel stocks, and these didn't survive very long. And so the SIG engineering team came up with this absolutely brilliant component. This is a neoprene rubber buttstock. So it's a solid neoprene stock. Some people say these are rubberized, uh, implying that there's a substrate of different material. No, this is indeed solid rubber. You can see I'm bending this with the force of my fingers. And they last really well. It's crazy. Because yeah. uh, this rifle, my rifle's from what, 1963? Judging by the number, yeah, it's early yeah. production. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, it's still got the original butt on it. It's crazy. Yeah, these, these hold up really, really well. It's a very good material that they've chosen. Uh, essentially speaking, the basic design was patented by the chief engineer, Rudolf Amsler, and he describes in his patent kind of a disposition with the stock tube. Essentially speaking, if you take a look at the stock, you have a cavity right here uh, between the stock tube and the so-called Kolbenbüchse, which is essentially the rear guide tube that is integrally molded into the rubber buttstock. And essentially, this creates kind of a, a deformation zone. When the rifle recoils from the rifle grenade recoil, this forces the material to wrinkle in these particular areas, and this dissipates part of the energy, which helps reduce the wear on some other critical components. Pretty brilliant design. And you can see that SIG was obviously very proud of this design feature, and you can see it in various brochures. Uh, of course, in export variations, because the stock weighs a whopping, I think, 600 grams, it's extremely heavy. Uh, on the export versions, for example, the 510-1s, some were proposed with wooden stocks and some others with rubber stocks. So they had the two options. But for the Swiss Army, all Sturmgewehr 57s were delivered with the neoprene buttstock. Now, I already showed this piece of footage in the Sturmgewehr 57 episode, but now that I conveyed you a bit more information on the design, I want you to look at it again, this time with the right orientation. You can see it really responds very well to the requirements. So here it's fired with the booster charge at a slight angle, and you can see how severe the deformation is, especially in this particular area right here. Let me pause this for a second. Well, no pause, but you got the idea, basically. This stock really collapses onto itself, and that's what gives it, you know, its durability. And just imagine it's your shoulder. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why you don't want to shoulder this, otherwise exactly. your shoulder becomes the crumple zone. Um, now, of course, this doesn't mean that it absorbs all of the energy. Um, there are some other interfaces in the design as well that are designed to absorb this kind of, uh, of shock. This one would be, for example, the stock tube interface, which is extremely overbuilt on the Sturmgewehr. It is essentially a drop forged and machine part, as you can see right here, and it interfaces directly with the rear trunnion of the receiver. Now, interestingly, during trials, uh, they noted that after hundreds and hundreds of rifle grenades, this becomes the weak area. Essentially, what happens is that the stock claws have a tendency to widen, and in fact they had procedures at the arsenal for tightening these back up, basically with special devices and procedures. But back to the point, when I visited the SIG Foundation Museum, I stumbled across this original manufacturer technical drawing for uh, the stocks, and in fact there were two major subcontractors that manufactured the stocks. You can easily spot them because they have a marking right here, so essentially you have a manufacturer date and the actual prefix of the subcontractor. So two subcontractors were involved, Detwiler AG, which I think makes uh, cable housings, and Huber, which later became Huber und Zuna, uh, both uh, very big players in the Swiss rubber industries, and they both provided rubber stocks and also rubber heads for the rifle grenades. So ah. it's, uh, it's all linked together. Uh, if you take a look at the technical drawing, uh, you can see how complex this entire part is. It must be a pretty complicated molding when I think about it. You can clearly see that there, there's a bushing right here, and this is basically what screws into the stock tube. And of course, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the secondary guide tube for the stock tube to help guide the stock when it collapses. Now, interestingly, and that's information that I found recently, there are two variants of the rubber stock. There's a variant with an obturating lid right here, and a variant without the obturating lid. I think I bought both of them. 
So here you can clearly see the one with and without. Now you might ask, why? And the reason for that is, in 1959, the design with the obturating lid was retained. And it was noted that during trials, the hole that held the obturating lid had a tendency to stretch especially after repeated rifle grenade cycles. And what tends to happen is that the stock would fail in this area. And so an improvement that was made was to simply close it off with an integral molding with a small steel disc. You might wonder, why do you even have a hole in the first place? Uh, apparently it was to align the mold elements uh, during injection molding, essentially speaking. So they also changed the die, which probably was a pretty expensive procedure. And these two were initially introduced as variants. And later on, when they noticed that the failure rate was too high, it was outright replaced with a new pattern. So this is something that's interesting for you Sturmgewehr collectors out there, if they even exist. Outside of Switzerland, probably not. Uh, probably not. If you could please hold this for me. Now, what I'm going to show you next is an interesting aspect of the Sturmgewehr. It's the rifle grenade launching magazine, officially called the Weisses Magazin, or White Magazine. Uh, the idea behind this magazine is to separate, basically, have a separate loading solution for your rifle grenade launching cartridges. Uh, Can I just insert a point from the earlier video? Um, they didn't go to bullet trap or shoot through designs simply because of the huge payload and what they wanted to do. Basically, uh, there's not enough room to have the payload or the kinds of warheads they wanted with a bullet trap or shoot through design, in fact, absolutely impossible with a shoot through design, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what they wanted to do. So it had by definition to be a propelling cartridge. Precisely. Design. Basically, cartridge with no bullet. Uh, they kind of took over the tradition of the Carabiner 31 and 11 rifle grenade systems with a separate kind of uh, silver colored magazine. Uh, of course, other armies, such as Warsaw Pact armies, uh, if you take the Polish KBKG, these also had a 10-round magazine with a kind of a block to prevent you from actually inserting ball ammunition because the propelling ammunition was slightly shorter in overall length. But what is really unique about the Sturmgewehr 57's magazine, or white magazine, is that it has a positive locking system that turns the Sturmgewehr 57 into a Carabiner 57, essentially speaking. That's not official. <laughs> That's not official. Please don't quote me on this in uh, other YouTube videos. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, essentially speaking, we must. I, mean, I need to remind you that the Sturmgewehr 57, let me show you the big cutaway of death here, is a roller delayed blowback mechanism, which means that the cartridge case turns into a gas piston and presses on the bolt head. And because of the clever arrangement of the bolt body to the bolt head, there's a mechanical disadvantage that slows the cartridge case down to acceptable safety limits, and that's what makes the weapon tick. But there's a problem to this. If you take, for example, gas-operated weapons, if you want to transition to rifle grenades, you simply shut the gas off. In the case of the Sturmgewehr, well, there's not much you can do, except if you introduce a special kind of magazine with a unique locking system. I'm going to detail this a bit later on. Now, this is the very, very first concept of this particular magazine, and interestingly, it's completely made out of plastic. Um, I guess SIG really wanted to innovate at the time. Uh, have you seen one in the live? Yeah, uh, this, this was, is one I photographed physically at the SIG Foundation Museum. Uh, they very proudly show it, and I was very impressed in seeing this. It was co-developed by uh, the plastic industry uh, giant Weidmann, which I think is still in business today. They make uh, Sturmgewehr 90 components. <clears throat> and basically speaking, um, it's two halves that are glued together, astonishingly. And uh, yeah, basically this was supposed to be your magazine. It's a really interesting uh, design. Uh, we also took a look through the original technical drawings on tracing paper. It was absolutely crazy stuff. And essentially, here you can see how the locking mechanism works. Now, essentially speaking, the interface between the magazine and the rifle is this little doodad right here, this little tab. We can show you this on a later magazine right here. You can see it going up and down when I depress that button. Speaking of a button, there it is right here. So essentially, you have kind of this cantilever setup. Very simple. When you push the button in, this pulls the tab down and this allows locking and unlocking of the bolt. I'm gonna detail how this is actually done on the rifle later on. 
On the right, you can see the original technical drawing for one of the halves of the magazine. It's really crazy stuff. I mean, they really took into account every single minute detail in the design. <clears throat> and this was the design, the design was finalized roughly in summer of 1959. And unfortunately, I don't have many reports on how it performed, but something tells me that the plastic design was probably too experimental. That's just speculation because, well, obviously we have the benefit of, uh, of hindsight. In this case, the much later variants were all steel, so they did have durability problems. Now, little anecdote, the troops <clears throat> that were involved in the practical trials during the testing period called these uh, electric razors because of their, uh, you know, cosmetics. So that's something that Broadbeck told me when I visited the SIG Foundation Museum. Now, the plastic design was quickly shelved uh, for obvious reasons, and so they transitioned to more conventional designs. The very first production or pre-series design, which I have here, was interestingly aluminum. Now, these are extremely rare. I think they only made about 500 to 1,000 of these before they transitioned to the steel design. And uh, basically, it's the same concept, but just deep drawn aluminum. You can see it's very recognizable with its flat, smooth sides. Now this one you can see has been very well used. Uh, interestingly, even the magazine lugs are aluminum, which I find a bit astonishing. You know, such an important wear point still made out of aluminum. But these are relatively featherweight and also probably not very durable. Now around 1961-ish, uh, they transitioned to a steel design. And interestingly enough, there's this transitional model right here. Now you might ask, for those of you who are familiar with these rifle grenade magazines, what's the difference with the later ones is simply that these do not have a cartridge support shelf. You can see right here. On the picture you can see it quite clearly. These have the same drawn profile as the aluminum magazines. Now you might ask, why do the later magazines have this cartridge support shelf? Uh, again, very sparse documentation on these, but it seems and this is just speculation on my part. The problem with these rifle grenade magazines is that they don't support the cartridges very well. What tends to happen is that under the heavy recoil of the rifle, the cartridges which stay stationary because of inertia have a tendency to slam forward into the front wall of the magazine. And these aren't very good for the cartridges because they have wooden plugs. Once the plugs get broken or pushed in, uh, moisture can get inside, thus rendering your cartridges useless. So my, spe my point is, when you have this support shoulder, it has direct contact with the shoulder of the cartridge, and this basically gives you much better support during firing. Um, so yeah, there you go. There's the evolution of the rifle grenade launching magazine. Let's talk a little bit about how it actually locks, because I remember when Mike did the video on the velocities when you turn on or turn off the gas with or without automation, uh, I really found it astonishing that the design could resist the bolt thrusts of GP11, which probably wasn't designed for. You forbade me from using the Mint unused magazine for it. You, Dale sent me a... Uh... <laughs> I sent him the ugliest, crappiest magazine in my inventory just to be very safe, and it was completely fine. Absolutely fine. It's crazy. And so uh, I told myself, this is really crazy. So I had to investigate further on what the design intents were, and what I discovered was fascinating. So first of all, my first intuition is, if this thing could resist the bolt thrust, you can intuitively understand that there's a problem. Essentially, how the magazine works, um, thank you very much. If you take a look at the bolt carrier, you have a very distinct notch right here. And essentially speaking, if I place the magazine on the screen, the tab lodges itself in the notch, thus locking the bolt. It's that simple. Press the button in, the latch depresses, and this frees the bolt for loading. Now, I always wondered, okay, if during firing the thrust is applied in this direction, that means that it's going to press directly on the tab in this way. It's going to bend the tab this way. And intuitively speaking, what is the weakest link in the system? And my intuition was, well, the magazine shell, obviously. You can understand that with repeated cycles, eventually the tab is going to bow the rear of the magazine out, except that they thought this through. If you take a look at this technical drawing right here, it really shows astonishingly well what the design intent is. Basically speaking, here you have your bolt carrier interface, and here is a mysterious piece called the 
Verbindungsbügel. Now, what is that? Here's, here's the interesting part. The tab was actually designed to be sandwiched between two strong interfaces. It's not designed to support all the thrust by itself and the magazine body. Here's a really clever part. So let me show you what this mysterious Verbindungsbügel is. Literal translation of that isn't actually very informative. It's just connecting... Connecting bracket. Bracket. Exactly. Stirrup, something like that. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. So first we need to appreciate how the Sturmgewehr 57 receiver is constructed. Essentially, it's an amalgamation of different uh, steels, different manufacturing procedures, all consolidated into one monolithic part. So basically you have two drop forged and machined trunnions, a center stamping, a charging handle rail, which is a profiled steel section. It's actually not a stamping, interestingly enough. The trigger pack, uh, lug, so to speak, and the tube, and finally, the famous Verbindungsbügel. There it is. Ah, so okay, just, to more sense. just to show you very clearly, this basically this chair-shaped apparatus right here. I call it, it kind of looks like a chair, right, when you turn yeah. it like this. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Verbindungsbügel that the technical drawing was talking about, and it's essentially a profiled steel section. Just imagine it projected like this and cut into shape with the salami principle for industrialization. This is the first time I've looked at it, but I'm now absolutely clear where that name comes from because what it's doing is it's making the interface between the magazine housing and the main tube of the receiver. And it's, it's been welded there, welded, welded there, and then welded there to connect it. So when you look at that drawing, you think it's something to do you think, why they called it that? Because you think it's, okay, it's specifically to do with that, but it's, it's, it's not. They've integrated it with, a, with a, um, a stirrup, basically, that attaches these two stampings together. Precisely, so, yeah. Interesting, huh? I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially speaking, this reinforces the weak part of the receiver, yep. as you say, because this is a sharp corner here, and plus it adds magazine support even with regular GP11. But, as you can see, the technical drawing proves it. When the bolt thrust is applied, the tab, all it does is simply transmit the force to this part, which has much more area and dissipates the energy throughout the receiver. So it's not concentrated. What a clever design. The engineers really thought it through, really. Now, interestingly enough, you mentioned that these were spot welded. Uh, interestingly, these were spot welded to initially consolidate their position. After they were consolidated, these are hard copper braised oh, at about 1100 to 1120 degrees Celsius in a conveyor oven. And so essentially, for those of you not familiar, brazing is essentially when you place a metal which has a lower melting point than your substrate material. And when you heat up the entire part, the copper melts and it actually flows into the cracks between the parts that I mentioned before. And when it cools, becomes one monolithic steel part. So all this just to save money in terms of machining instead of machining out a solid block. Pretty clever, I gotta say. Okay, white magazine out of the way. Let's talk about the graduated bipod. The graduated bipod is a feature that, you, that is used in indirect fire, primarily. And this is integrated directly into the forged aluminum bipod of the Sturmgewehr 57. Now, interestingly speaking, the very first models, which I have a picture of underneath, were graduated for the previous pattern of practice grenades. So the 1960 pattern, which weighed roughly 1.07 kilos. Uh, when the transition was made to the new pattern of rifle grenades, and again, for context, I recommend that you watch part two of the series, uh, the ballistic curve changed, which means that all the scales that were delivered had to be changed. And so the initials, sticker, so to speak, essentially it's an anodized aluminum sticker, was changed to a decal. And they tried a whole bunch of variations, some were yellow, some were silver, white, or red, to see how which contrast played the well. And I guess the final solution was kind of this traffic yellow, so to speak. And the decals are applied to both the left and the right bipod. Now, the left bipod has a scale for rifle grenades with the booster charge, so 100 to 400 meters, and the right bipod leg has a scale for the rifle grenades without the booster charge, so with the obturator. And these are graduated from 40 to 140 meters. 
So we'll see later on with the firing techniques, but it's important to select the appropriate bipod leg for the appropriate fire mode. Now to work in conjunction with uh, the scale, we have of course the famous soldier's knife, Zordatenmesser, or Zakmesser, or Taschenmesser, as some people call it. Um, interestingly, all the, all the Swiss knives, not just came undone, from 1951 to the 1961 version, here I have a 1961 version, have a little eyelet in them for a lanyard loop officially, but these were also used in conjunction with a string, if you hang it like this, as a plumb line. And so intuitively, you can see in these pictures right here, you simply hang the plumb line off the designated area in the rifle, could be bayonet lug or the sling loop, depending on how you were trained. And you can see, you basically have a makeshift inclinometer Exactly, so this helps you determine the right angle for the appropriate range for the rifle grenade. So really clever stuff. Uh, this was a technique that was developed in Wallenstadt roughly around 1958 when they did the first trials. And uh, yeah, it was just deemed simpler and more effective. You know, it was pretty cheap, but it did have its disadvantages and we're going to talk about it later on. Next, something that's a bit less sexy but still important, PPE. Now, interestingly enough, uh, when looking through the documents at the Federal Archives, I stumbled across this folder that treated on the subject of so-called Strapazierstürmgewehre. So essentially, if you translate literally, it's basically abuse rifles. Uh, interestingly, these were pre-series rifles, so the first 2,000 rifles delivered were uh, not exactly up to standards, but the Army still kept them in inventory, and so they downgraded them to the so-called Strapazier uh, kind of setup. The idea behind these rifles was that they allowed, uh, you know, stuff like uh, close quarter training, so where they're banging rifles a lot on, uh, on walls and whatnot, and also for the very first rifle grenade shooting. So some uh, former militiamen that are probably watching this video, you probably recall that you had to exchange your personal weapon for some other weapon and to fire rifle grenades with. There's probably a high chance that these were Strapazier, that was a Strapazier Sturmgewehr. Now, how do you recognize these? And these were actually marked at the arsenal with, I believe, was a yellow, yellow square or a white square, something like that, I forgot. But depending on the color, it could either designate a Strapazier Sturmgewehr or a rifle on loan for young shooters. So that depends on the status of the weapon. And essentially, these were used as abuse rifles, interestingly. Also, the topic of safety goggles. Uh, this is not explicitly specified in the manual, but what's interesting is that because of the rocket booster setup of the rifle grenades, it was highly recommended to wear some sort of eye protection. Uh, not only are there particulates from the actual rocket booster burning, but there's also, if, if you have foreign material on the muzzle area or in the propulsor tube, I can guarantee it's going to get blasted out altogether. And also if you're in sandy or rocky terrain, you might have a bit of foreign material blasted towards you. So safety goggles were highly recommended. What was usually used was a pattern of goggles generally used for rocket launcher crews. These look kind of like aviator or welder goggles. Look absolutely horrible, by the way. And these have uh, basically um, glass plates to protect the eyes. Next, gloves. Now, gloves is uh, an interesting topic because it kind of depended on the style of the infantryman. Some did not wear gloves what, uh, at all. Others wore gloves uh, that were used by rocket launcher crews. These are the raccoir mittens, essentially speaking. And others used the three-finger wool gloves or some even used private leather gloves. It kind of depended on how you wanted to shoot. And these are important because, for example, here you can see the militiaman doesn't have a glove on his firing hand, you know, for better sens sensitivity, but his support hand does have a glove because you can understand that when he fires that anti-personnel grenade off, you have a nice little jet of unburned powder gases that uh, project on your hand. Yeah, exactly. You can even see in the um, Kampf der Infanterie when they fire it, you can see the amount of flinching that they have when they uh, fire these rifle grenades. And I don't think they were wearing gloves for the film at least. Next, how do you carry all this equipment? So I showed you the Sturmgewehr 57, it's carried by a sling. I showed you the rifle grenade launching magazine, the soldier's knife. How do you carry all this in the field? And of course, I almost forgot, how do you carry the rifle grenades? And interestingly, we can talk a little bit about the M61 and the M73, uh, M70, excuse me, combat dresses, officially called the Kampfanzug. 
the idea basically behind this um, combat dress is to offer a completely integrated load-bearing solution with a camouflage smock all-in-one. It's kind of an unusual uh, technique. And so the idea is you have the base as a camouflage smock and you sew all of the pockets necessary for the individual combatant, as they call it at the time, uh, basically to have everything on you. Now the advantage is everybody gets the same combat dress. The disadvantage is this thing is very hot, very heavy, extremely complex to maintain and difficult to wash. Uh, from a logistical perspective, it was, it was very difficult. Just as a point, they were not issued to the individual. No. You got them handed to you when you turned up to a course. Precisely, which is a reason why you never find these with so-called privat stamps. These are all core material, uh, which further reinforces the point of them not trusting the average soldier to actually take care of these because these are extremely complicated. Just the, the sewing work that needs to be done on these required very, very highly skilled personnel. There are two main variants of the uh, Kampfanzug. The very first version was introduced roughly in the mid to early 60s. And uh, small improvements were made that were considered significant enough to basically change the nomenclature to Kampfanzug 70. And the modifications include, for example, waterproofing of the elbow area, the deletion of the wind cuff, and instead it was replaced by an elasticated uh, uh, cuff. In, in this case, I'm wearing an M70. They deleted the integrated bayonet holder, which was considered useless because you could just use your standard leather bayonet carrier, and small minute details like the addition of a button or extra loops for carrying the rifle grenades. I'm going to show these to you later. Now, of course, the Kampfanzug was not just the smock, it was also a complete solution composed of a combat trouser, which is equally hot and heavy. These are extremely oversized, by the way, because they're probably designed to be worn over clothing. Uh, for some reason, mine has really short arms, but the, the actual chest part is okay. So I don't understand how they proportioned it, but go figure. The trousers also minutely changed. The strap arrangement was slightly modified. More waterproofing introduced, which was a bit controversial because it tended to be extremely hot. This wasn't Gore-Tex material. This is basically just vinyl. And so you can understand that any sort of moisture is going to pool inside of your pants and it was extremely unpleasant. Interestingly, the, the trousers had pockets for hand grenades. So you're supposed to carry four hand grenades in your thigh area. And, of course, to carry the rifle grenades and the rockets, depending on your role, you have, of course, the Kampfanzug Rucksack. Now, essentially speaking, let me show this to you. This is a later pattern. It's really a remarkably simple piece of fabric. It's just a kind of an H-shaped piece with two side pockets, tube-shaped pockets on the side, and a central pocket for whatever doodads you need to get you put inside. Now, you might notice, although I call this a rucksack, it doesn't have actually shoulder straps because these are supposed to pass through your epaulets into the steel loops right here. Essentially, that's how you do it. And of course, to prevent from rattling, rattling around back and forth, you have a sort of waist strap on the bottom that goes underneath your belt. And just the obvious, say the obvious thing, the obvious conclusion is that all the weight in all of this is on your shoulders. Exactly, not very pleasant. They didn't issue webbing. If you wish, if you wish you with this sort of suit, you carried everything you needed in that or in a rucksack on the top. But yeah. like, I mean, there's a there's a there's a pocket in this for your mess kit and everything. Literally, everything hanging on your shoulders. Yeah, it's not great. Um, huh? actually, when I thought about it, you can see this mysterious strap right here, and I was wondering what it is for. This loose strap, and what I found interesting is that these interface directly with the steel loops. And these are designed to go over these particular clasps on your trousers. So essentially speaking, what I found with the problem with these rucksacks is that when you carried rifle grenades, it tended to hoist your jacket right up. And luckily the straps were there because that means your trousers are getting hoisted up and you're getting a wedgie essentially when you're carrying these rifle grenades. Great design, very ergonomic. Uh, but yeah, it was a very characteristic look of the Swiss infantrymen during the Cold War. And it did have its uh, cult following, the so-called Vierfrucht Pyjama. Uh, but yeah, that's basically the Kampfanzug for you. It's not very sexy from a technical perspective, uh, but indeed, still quite fascinating for us rifle grenade enthusiasts. Load-bearing jackets are a, 
there was a period in the 90s where they came back into fashion as a private purchase item. Uh, one of our university OTC directing staff had one and he just stood there with all this stuff on it and <laughs> it was thinking, like, yeah, it's, it's Ali, but is it actually any good? Probably not. It sounds nice on paper, probably, but in actual execution, not so much. Well, maybe today with more modern garments, you could argue that you could probably make something much better than at the time. Yeah, but now, now everything, everyone's wearing plates. Exactly. And body yeah. armor and hanging stuff off that instead. It's not, it's not going to fly yeah, anymore. Interesting. Okay, so now that all the equipment has been explained, let's move on to basic handling. So, Mike, shall we? All right, basic handling 101. The first one is... GP11 to rifle grenade transition. Extremely important drill. Now I'm not going to show the actual firing technique, just the actual procedures to transition to the rifle grenade. The actual firing techniques will be done in a separate video. So assume that you're using the rifle in the standard mode and now you have received the order to transition to the rifle grenade or on your own initiative. Step one would be of course fold the diopter safety on Take cover. All manipulations with the rifle grenade essentially are done with the stock on the ground and the rifle turned to the side. You can of course do these manipulations standing up, my opinion a bit impractical. So essentially speaking all manipulations done on the stock on the ground. Now the actual drill starts. Essentially the first step is actually unloading the rifle and for those of you who have served with the Sturmgewehr you probably did this several times ad nauseum but this is going to re-inject some memories. One, check winner trigger. Two, remove magazine. Three, clear chamber. Four, check chamber indicator. Five, safety off, dry fire, safety on. Now your weapon is considered clear and you can now transition to the rifle grenade. Step one, from the right side of your combat vest pocket, extract your in this case, assume that it's preloaded rifle grenade magazine. Seat it. Now the rifle grenade magazine is a bit tricky to insert because it's extremely stubby and small. It's easy to actually over insert it. And you can see here I've over inserted it, the magazine is stuck. If you do run in these kind of malfunctions, it's okay. You can just depress the catch a little bit and put it in place. Now to remove the magazine, some people do it like this. I don't like it because you basically pinch your, your thumb in this particular area. So usually I take this finger and just actuate the magazine catch like this. Back to the point. Magazine is now in place. You can now extract and remove your rifle grenade. Now in this case, I don't think this was actually done at the time. I am simulating extracting it from an emergency backpack. Normally you would have them prepared on the side. Extracting your rifle grenade. Remove the obturating lid. Seat on the rifle, and very important, rotary control. The reason for this is multiple. You want to make sure that the tube is actually a good technical condition. If there are dents in the tube, you're going to feel it bind. Interestingly, before 1964, the practice was to do a lateral movement like this, but because it ruined the obturator contact, it was replaced with the rotary movement. Now I'm ready to charge the weapon. Remember the white magazine? There's a little doodad that unlocks the bolt. With a smart movement, push the button, charge energetically, check the chamber indicator. And now, your rifle is ready to be used with the rifle grenade. Suppose I have just fired with the rifle and I want to actually reload and repeat. In this particular case, same manip manipulation, excuse me, rifle on the ground stock to the side. Extract, second rifle grenade. Remove obturating lid. Seat on rifle, rotary movement. Press, eject, charge, check chamber indicator, and you're back in business. Now you might wonder, why is this dude farting about with the obturating lid? Uh, the problem is, if you notice, the way these rifle grenades are carried is basically with the bottom side up. And you can understand that in a combat situation with lots of particles being flung about and not to mention moisture, is actually uh, 
can deactivate the rocket motor, especially for rain. It was found that with just a little bit of rain water, the rocket motor is spoiled. And so essentially, if you do train on this system, I suppose at the time that's what it was done, the obturator lid would therefore be removed only at the very last moment, except if you prepare your position by covering the rifle grenades, of course. Next, unloading. Suppose that the threat has changed and I want to change back to GP11. Let me prepare this by simulating the magazine in the mag pouch. And there's space for five magazines? In the Correct. Pouch? So two pouches here, one pouch is here. This leaves your shoulder free for right-handed shooters, of course. So suppose the threat has changed. I want to unload the rifle grenade. Step one, safety on. In this case, already on. Remove rifle grenade and unload procedure. One, check the winner trigger. Two, remove the white magazine. Stow it. Three, clear the chamber. Four, check the chamber indicator. Safety off. Dry fire, safety on. Now, you can prepare the rifle for actual rifle use. So there you go, as you can see, um, basic handling is relatively simple. All it takes is just a few steps, but you can see how convoluted the drill actually was. And I can understand why people uh, really didn't like that system at the time, but that's just the way it is. So, I think that's enough for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dale, for coming to talk about that. We, today for, in our time, today now continues with, uh, with uh, part two, which will be in a future video. So thanks very much for watching. Uh, thanks again to patrons. Please check out Dale's channel. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so much for coming again, and uh, see you all again sometime. Bye. See you next video.